I'm Brendan Donnelly. I'm the director of the Federal Trust, and this is going to be the latest in our series of conversations with Graham Bishop about the city after Brexit. Uh, Graham is a, a well-known financial analyst and writer who's also a member of the Council of the Federal Trust. Graham, uh, a number of people uh, have started going back to work in the city at the end of this first year after Brexit. Um, how does it look? How do things look when they get back to their desk? In particular, I'm interested in the question of CCPs, which every time I read an article about Brexit and the city seems to figure very largely. Uh, can you tell us <laughs> yes. what it stands for and um, <laughs> what the importance of the concept is? Yes, yes. OK, uh, the CCP is a central counterparty. And this is what happens to any derivatives transaction which is not done in an exchange. Um, the vast majority, uh, not all, the vast majority now uh, between two parties to start with, two different banks, and then the central counterparty is put in between them to guarantee the performance of that contract to both other parties. So it's, it's an insurance mechanism. Um, but of course, that does mean if the CCP goes bust, then both parties to that contract have a huge problem. So the systemic stability is dramatic. How important is it to the City of London and its profitability? Well, it's difficult to say about the profitability uh, directly, but um, it is <clears throat> in modern capital markets, they are central because derivatives have now become completely central to capital market transactions, separating out interest rate risk, uh, currency risk and so on, credit risk as well. <clears throat> so any, any entity which is there to um, ensure that those risks are fulfilled and accurately transferred or not, um, they are central. And that's the underpinning of the city's capital market activities is uh, derivatives or are derivatives and therefore CCPs. That's their importance. There are undoubtedly profits to be made out of, or there are, uh, out of um, dealing in uh, derivatives. But the CCP question is a different order of magnitude. Can you give us some figures on it? Yes, um, I think there are three numbers you want to keep in mind, actually, um, just three. First of all, 3.2 trillion, not billion, a trillion, thousand billion euros of trading every day, each and every day, in um, interest rate swaps in, denominated in euros. Forget about dollars and sterling. Um, and 94% of that, roughly, is done in London. That's the two of them. The third one is that 80 trillion are outstanding um, in the EU as a whole. Now, just uh, these trillions, uh, what does that mean to anyone? Well, the UK's GDP is 2 trillion. So the daily trading in, in euro-denominated CCPs, or the derivatives contracts, is twice, round figures, the UK's annual GDP. And at 80 trillion, um, it's, um, it's the UK, the EU's GDP is about 15. So that's five or six times the EU's GDP. So if anything goes wrong with this, and the UK economy is required to, shall they say, backstop and the tax revenues of the UK to backstop the CCP system, you're talking about something which is um, 40 times the UK's GDP. Uh, 10, six, six or eight times the EU's GDP. That's why it's so important. It sounds from what you've said with the 94% figure that you've quoted, that until now, mm -hmm. Brexit hasn't made a great deal of difference to the predominance of the city in this area. Is that no, correct? No, it's true. Yeah, it's true. Um, not much has happened. The, the, at the beginning of the year, the EU's share went up slightly, it settled back again slightly. No, no big difference, what it boils down to. But that's not going to last. Why not? because the EU isn't going to allow it, <laughs> quite simple. How will they have the mechanism not to allow it? Well, um, <clears throat> we don't yet know. Um, a couple of weeks ago, uh, maybe it's a month, Commissioner McGuinness said um, that there were going to be no sudden twists and turns and cliff edge in the um, equivalence uh, granted to UK CCPs until the middle of next year. And then um, last week, I think, he then came out with a statement on all this and set out you know, read my lips, um, listen to my words. This matters. This is um, systemically very important to the EU. And in the medium term, it's got to be addressed. So there's no doubt where they're going. But the only question is when, how quickly and how. Uh, these are quite relevant considerations. Uh, when and how 
Uh, what do you say to the when and how, Graham? The, the, the when is um, not clear, except that it's going to be in the medium term. There is a, a work program underway at the at ESMA, the European Securities Market Authority, uh, of the CCP's um, supervisory committee. Um, and they are planning to come forward with uh, comments in the second half of next year on, first of all, the stress test, the 2021 stress test, they will come up with the answers. And the methodology for that is very wide ranging. And this is a stress test which looks not at each individual CCP, because they have to do that themselves, but between the all the 15 CCPs of significance in the EU, how they're all interlinked, because we, that's the key thing. So in the second half of the year, they will come forward with their stress test, and then they will start talking about uh, with the benefit of that information uh, about the significance of the financial stability risks to the EU and to clients, the institutions themselves and so on. But what the EU is of course interested in is its financial stability. But what, the, well, what are the likely recommendations mm -hmm. going to be of this committee on the how? Because ah, well. <laughs> 90 percent is a very significant figure to yes. try and militate against, isn't it? Yes, yes. Um, the EU is under no illusions this is going to be done easily. They had hoped that the um, advent of Brexit would just make things move naturally uh, across to Frankfurt, to Deutsche Börse and so on. That hasn't happened. Um, <clears throat> so now what they're doing is looking, are going to look at how they can um, amend the EU's own rules, so the EU's own supervision of CCPs in the EU is fit for purpose, which they didn't think it really is at the moment. So that's number one. Number two is then how to provide, how, how to ensure that the EU system provides the liquidity. Um, and this is where you get into questions of the role of the central bank, the ECB. Uh, if you go back to um, 2011, when this first, when Brexit first started coming onto the horizon. Uh, I very well remember the ECB coming up with a series of studies which, uh, and papers, which said that, uh, pointed out that the Committee on Payments and Market Infrastructure, CPMI, which is a Basel type committee, was very clear that the central bank of issue must have control over the activities of CCPs, amongst other things. So the central bank of issue of the euro is called the European Central Bank. So one way or another, that is going to have a profound influence on how CCPs develop and therefore how the um, ECB could get drawn into providing liquidity in an emergency. After all, the Bank of England can't provide euro liquidity on the scale we're talking about in an emergency. We'd have to ask for it from the ECB. Would the ECB give it? They might at the moment feel compelled to, but obviously they don't want to hand over large chunks of um, uh, EU citizens' assets to, the, uh, to be at the risk of a foreign country, a third country. But isn't that the position at the moment, um, willy-nilly, that because the ECB ah. haven't yet um, <laughs> taken the steps necessary to ensure um, the, the domination of the EU in this market, they are dependent on the, on the city. Yeah, they are, exactly. And they don't like it. And it's not that they don't like it, they're afraid of it, because these CCPs, given, remember the numbers I talked about at the beginning, they're six, seven times the EU's GDP outstanding, but 40 times the UK. There's no, no way on earth that the UK, in the event of a crisis, and of course there are all sorts of rules which say there shouldn't be a crisis, but crises come along quite, quite often from time to time. Um, so... The EU knows perfectly well in the event of a crisis, even if they could trust the UK, and Article 16 immediately pops into your mind, even if they could trust the UK, could it deliver? Would it deliver under those sort of circumstances? Hmm. This is exactly what they're going to be looking at over the next year or so and thinking, what's, what can be done about it? But surely one of the things that will need to be done about it is the building up of... Um, of, of of the capacity um, of EU institutions to take on the burden of this 94%. Uh, yeah, what's yeah. being done in that direction? What do you think will be done in that direction? Well, um, not a lot is being done right now. Uh, the question is, and this is what will be answered by these various studies, including the, the stress test, um, what is it that's impeding 
the um, movement of euro denominated clearing to into the euro area is it regulations is it the perception that the um, eu supervisory authorities aren't up to it there's a lack of liquidity or and i think this is probably the case is it that the markets know perfectly well um, at the moment the uk offers um, or institutions resident in the uk offer clearing facilities in dollars and euro and sterling and anything else. So the ability to cross currency margin is a major saving. And breaking that, uh, that cross currency margining is an expense. So the, the markets say, if we don't have to incur an expense, we're profit maximizing institutions, don't incur it. Now, the question for the EU might be, will they push the market to the point where the markets will say, well, we don't want to bear the costs of this um, uh, extra margin, let's move all clearing to the euro area. Now that is something which people don't talk about. And I suspect that that's, this is the obvious thing for the markets to do. Let's just move everything to the, under the aegis of the ECB. We know they've got a, they can create euro as need be. They can't create dollars, it's still got to go to the Fed. But that's, that is the obvious solution at some stage, is that the whole lot shifts. That would be very serious. We were talking about when. This sounds quite a, a large undertaking. Um, what's the minimum amount of time before this tipping point is reached, where I could see that after a certain point, it might go quite rapidly. But yes. there's quite a long way to go, it seems to me, until we get to that tipping point. Yes, you're right. Um, I'd say the minimum of a year, probably more like three, four years. Um, <clears throat> always remember that the Commission operates on uh, timescales which are run by its five-year cycle. So we're now, I think, roughly halfway through the term. I'm sure Commissioner McGuinness will want to leave office having put into place the regulations, and even if her successor then finishes up operating them. So just uh, to change EMEA, the European Markets Infrastructure Regulation, uh, from scratch now, would be a couple of years. So anything that is to be done and then implementing it, uh, transposition and so on. So we're talking about two or three years minimum just to get the regulations, decide what you want to do and then get them into law and then implement them. And once they're in force, then the markets will begin to, well, they'll begin to anticipate that coming into force. But that's, that's why I'm thinking 24, maybe even 25 is the sort of time horizon when this will happen. And then you think it could happen quite rapidly? Once the market starts to move, and we've seen many examples in the past, and just to cite the obvious example, um, at one stage, LIFE, the UK exchange, dominated trading in German government derivatives. Uh, and the Deutsche Börse, the, the Frankfurt-based uh, body, started competing with a, an electronic system. And everyone said, oh, open outcry will continue. Uh, and hey presto, when Deutsche Börse got going, um, I remember my colleagues at Salomon saying, uh, dealing there is at one seventh of the price of dealing in London. What did they do? A few, yeah. few months later, all gone. Is the controversy and discussion about CCPs in, in any way symbolic of, of, of wider issues um, uh, about the desire to reassert the control of the, uh, of the Eurozone authorities um, over, over their own monetary area? Oh, yes, yes. I mean, it's, it's quite clearly it's about financial stability. And they're also looking at the question of, of banks. Um, the recent banking package is very clearly directed towards persuading <clears throat> and pushing banks to operate in euros in the eurozone. Um, one could look at the difference there, say, the, the tightening the existing rules versus the new rules. And I understand that the, that the Commission and other financial authorities in the European Union, uh, are going to take a less indulgent view than they have until now, of, of British banks based in Britain that are operating in Europe. Is that right? Yeah, it certainly is. And um, to something to the surprise of the UK banks. Um, <clears throat> I remember reading one story in the FT about a senior bank executive saying, well, we know what we agreed to, uh, when Brexit started, but we never thought when they got to it that they would enforce it. And now it seems they are, and they're pretty good at enforcing it. What a surprise. And the ECB has been saying this since Brexit was on the horizon, that there would be no 
letterbox organizations, empty mailboxes uh, operating back to back with their London base. And the real risk is in London and the nominal risk is, is in uh, the euro area. It would never be allowed. They said it. And now they're doing something about it. Yes, they paused it for uh, the pandemic um, period, but that's, well, <clears throat> is receding, was receding. Maybe that'll change. But as soon as there's the, uh, the risk of pandemic is, is that much reduced, I think we'll see further pressure to implement the already agreed rules. Of course, the European Union is based on mutual understanding, but uh, I've always been struck by the way in which uh, uh, people do say things which they don't mean, and then they say things that they mean in deadly earnestness. Uh, and you have to differentiate between the two um, from what you're saying, the city or some people in the city haven't always got that right. Uh, are there any other concluding remarks you'd like to make? Yes, I'd just say the, the Commission's banking package is another example of this, where they talked about um, third country branches in the uh, EU, from branching from the UK, um, <clears throat> being insufficiently regulated. Um, they just proposed a banking package and they're going to, to tighten up the rules to be roughly the same as the UK enforces on other countries' branches here. Um, they just read my lips and it happens. Um, regulators enforce rules. That's a great surprise to a lot of people, but that's what happens. Can you see, is this a final question, um, uh, divergence um, between the banking and EU systems, quite apart from what the EU regulations say, um, that make it more difficult for um, British banks to operate within the European Union? Yes, I mean, look at the what's happening with the, the green agenda. Um, the EU is pushing ahead very quickly with its taxonomy on green regulations and a whole panoply, a whole suite of um, rules to make investors invest in green assets and banks uh, create them, et cetera, et cetera. Um, <clears throat> is the UK going to follow that exactly? Hmm, doubtful, because well, what's the point of leaving the EU otherwise? Uh, so when they diverge, who's got the bigger number of um, assets? The EU has, mm, from memory, 25 trillion of invested assets, not bank deposits, invested assets, and the UK's own population has about six. So it's the usual sort of um, four or five to one ratio. Who's going to win in the uh, big battalions? That seems to be the conclusion that if the big battalions don't win immediately, they'll win in the long term. Thank you very much, Graham. Very interesting and very informative as always. Thank you.